None of it. Nothing. There would be no society without fire. That's how it's represented in the ancient myths and in the mysteries. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? What is it represented as? A bolt of lightning struck a tree. The tree burst into flames. Ancient man, if you watch the movie Quest for Fire, rushed up and grabbed one of the burning branches and it burned his hand and he let it go. He probably didn't go any farther than that the first time. Second time he may have found a deer that had been roasted by the heat of the fire in the forest. And being hungry, maybe he partook of some of that meat and found that it tasted pretty good. Also, the fire was warm and didn't get cold at night. And this is where the whole battle between the forces of light and darkness comes from. Man sat up on a rock one night watching the sunset and said, Boy, I'm in deep trouble now. I can't see in the dark. There's wild beasts out there. There's tigers with teeth seven inches long that want me for dinner. What am I going to do? He didn't know what to do. Neither would many of us put in that situation. But we would know one thing, we're in deep trouble. And so for a good part of his history, man sat huddled in the darkness in some place that made him feel secure, waiting to be saved. Now remember folks, I'm not telling you what I believe. I'm telling you what is taught in the mysteries. I'm telling you what our enemies believe. Make no mistake about it, they are our mortal enemies. They want to see us wiped off the face of the earth. Man huddled in this darkness, fearful, trembling, cold, hungry, and around about he could hear the beast roaring. And sometimes they were roaring because they were after him. And sometimes he was eaten. A man eventually saw another tree struck by lightning and grabbed that branch with that flame on it. And by a little experimentation, he learned how to keep that fire going. And if he could keep the fire going, he knew something nobody else knew. And he became the first king, the first priest, the first scientist, all rolled into one. And he would burn this fire and keep it going. And other men in the cold of the night, wanting to escape from the terrors that were out there, would gravitate toward this glow. And they would see this man sitting there. And if he was kind, he would let them come to the fire. And they would be warm. And they would be protected because if the wild beast came, he'd pick up a branch and shove it in its face and the beast would go away. And so the forces of light overcame the forces of darkness. And in the sunshine of the morning, the newly risen, resurrected child that had died the night before, their Savior warmed them and saved them from the terrors of the Prince of Darkness. You have to study these things to understand your enemy. Any general who ventures upon a battlefield without understanding the enemy is doomed to defeat. Just like a militia that forms itself upon a peninsula has already created its own concentration camp. Unless it has a navy. Damn good militia, I might add. What is the upshot of this? What am I getting at here? These people believe, and they have conducted themselves according to their belief and their philosophy since the very dawn of man. 
These people learned how to control others through the use of a hidden knowledge. This ability to keep that fire going was a technology that nobody else knew. By observing the fire, by keeping it going, by creating ceremonies around this fire, they became a mystery to the others. A mystery always holds sway over those who don't understand it. And the priesthood was born. No king ever existed without the permission of the priesthood. Now, I don't care what religion you're talking about or what period of history you're talking about, it is the truth. The kings never had the power and don't to this day. Kings exist at the whim of the real power which is the priesthood standing behind the throne. And when the king ceased to be of benefit to the priesthood, they would simply poison him or get rid of him in some other way. The king is dead, long live the king, and there would be another king appointed. There was even a time in history when the king was a sacrificial king, just like John F. Kennedy was in the Temple of the Sun known as Dealey Plaza. They would pick a young man at the height of his virility, appoint him king for one year. During that time he could do or say or command whatever he wanted. The priesthood was always there to make sure he commanded the right things, have any woman that he wanted, and at the end of the year he was ceremoniously sacrificed upon a rock, his heart ripped out, his body dismembered into 14 pieces and scattered over the land, and this is where the legend of the Osirian cycle began. It was to ensure the fertility of the crops of the next year. And young men would volunteer for this in their patriotic duty to their kingdom, to their family, so that they could have prosperous years. Much as our young men may volunteer to rush out over the water to a place called Kuwait or Iraq and die in the God-forsaken sands of a place that nobody can even find on a map I never heard of until it happened all so that he can be called a patriot someone his family can be proud of it escapes me how they can ever arrive at these conclusions but they do and the priesthood always takes the most advantage of this willingness to sacrifice oneself upon the altar of his country. The problem with it is, it's very seldom really for the country. It's for the advancement of the agenda of the priesthood, whoever the priests happen to be at the time. Am I attacking the church? You better believe it. All churches, all organized religions that have existed since the beginning of the time. Am I attacking the religion of individuals? Never, not on your life. He wasn't trying to create a big church. He knew what happened to those things. And you're all wrong about that man. When you say you shouldn't get angry, you shouldn't curse, you shouldn't do things that upset other people, because that's what Jesus spent his whole life doing. He threw the money changers out of the temple. Don't you think that made some people angry? Don't you think it was rude to walk up to somebody's place of business, smack them in the mouth, grab their table, and throw it out the door? What about the time he cursed the fig tree? You know, pious Christians sometimes make me very angry. They don't even know Christianity. They don't know the man they're following. He was a revolutionary. He was a dangerous man. And by God, so am I. And so should you be. This country was founded by dangerous men. And 
The moment the people in this country cease to be dangerous men, it's going to be the day we cease to have a country. Their whole goal with this philosophy is to teach all men and women that the only end of life is to seek the utmost pleasure and happiness that you can get out of it because when you die there's nothing else. 